Okay, so first let me tell you about what is the data stream model. Um, the data stream is a, is a model of computing where the processor is given extremely restricted input, extremely restricted access to the input. Okay, so for us, the input is going to be a high dimensional vector, and we're given the vector as a series of additive updates to its coordinates. Okay, so we, we begin with the vector f, it's uh, initialized to zero, and uh, each time we read an item from the stream, we increment the corresponding coordinate of the vector. Okay, uh, so in this case, the streaming algorithm is maybe interested in computing the Euclidean length of this vector, so the two norm, uh, so that as the stream is read, the vector changes, and the goal is that at the end of the stream, the algorithm can output uh, square root of 21 in this case, or something that's an approximation to square root of 21. Okay, so the question is, uh, how much space do we need to, to output this approximation? So this would be trivial if we just store the entire vector, but the whole point of the streaming model is that uh, we have too much data. There's no way to store the entire vector. Um, so how can we estimate uh, this, this norm without uh, storing the vector? Okay, so there's a simple solution, which is uh, given by Alain, Mattias, and Zagady in um, 1996 is the first appearance of this. Um, we just sample a random vector, z, and we compute it in a product. Okay, so we can do this uh, because it's a linear function of, of f. We can compute this on the stream. And um, its expected value uh, of the, the inner product squared is just the square of the two norm. Okay, so um, in order to do this, we need to store the random ve vector z. If we use limited independence, um, we can do that with log n bits. And we need to store a single counter that's the, the inner product. So that's also log n bits. So if we uh, do the usual trick of, of Taking averages and medians, we get down to um, log n bits of storage to output a constant factor approximation to F2. Okay, so uh, norms on data streams have a long history. Uh, most of the work has been about approximating P norms, so LP, uh, P from uh, 1 to infinity. Uh, and there's broadly uh, two types of algorithms. There's, there's algorithms which I'm going to call uh, randomize and repeat. So there we inject some randomness into the stream. This was the vector uh, z on the previous slide. And we construct an unbiased estimator of the norm or of some function of the norm. Um, and then we use uh, some averaging and medians to get a high probability, uh, high quality estimate of the, the value of the norm. Okay, the, the second type of algorithm, which is, which is where uh, our algorithm is going to fall, is a hierarchical subsampling. So, so there, instead of approximating the norm immediately, we're actually going to construct an approximation to the vector f. Okay, so I try to make a small space approximation to f. Um, this this uh, uh, technique was introduced by Indic and Woodruff in 2005, and, and since then there's been a lot of uh, follow-on work with more hierarchical subsampling algorithms. And um, the algorithm we're going to use is essentially the Indic Woodruff algorithm, uh, but the analysis is, is quite a bit different, uh, as you'll see if you're, if you're familiar with uh, Indic Woodruff. Okay. Um, so, oh, yeah, there's uh, a lot of uh, matching lower bounds. So, all of these norms, which I've mentioned here, they have uh, optimal algorithms and, and matching lower bounds. Um, so, strong lower bounds, unconditional lower bounds in the streaming model. Uh, if I have some time at the end, I'll tell you about lower bounds. For us, uh, for stream symmetric norms, mostly I'm going to talk about the algorithm. Okay, so I'm going to show you matching upper and lower bounds uh, for symmetric norms. What I mean by a symmetric norm is the norm is uh, invariant under permutations of the coordinates. So LP norms have this property. And it's also invariant under taking absolute values of the coordinates or assign changes to the coordinates. Okay, again, the P norms example. So um, LP norms. Uh, I'll show you two more examples in a second. Um, there are also plenty of non-examples, like induced matrix norms or uh, the nuclear norm, for example, a matrix would not be a, a symmetric norm. One of the important properties of symmetric norms, which we're going to use a lot, is monotonicity. So if I have uh, two vectors, x and y, that satisfy this coordinate-wise order, then the norms also respect the order. Okay, that's uh, really important for our work. It allows us to um, translate an approximation to a vector uh, coordinate-wise to an approximation to the norm. Okay, before I can um, tell you about our, our main result, I need to, to give you a definition. Um, so we're going to call this the modulus of concentration. So it's a ratio of two parameters 
B and M. So what I do is I, I'll take the norm and I'll look at all the values of the norm on the unit sphere. That's the L2 unit ball. And uh, B is the maximum value that the norm takes over the unit sphere. Okay? M is the norm's median value. So you can think about if I randomly sample a vector from the unit sphere and plug it into the norm. This gives me a random variable. I look at the distribution of that random variable and I find the median. Okay, so probability that I'm at least the median is at least half and the probability I'm at most the median is also at least half. Okay, so here's, here's uh, three different norms. They're all symmetric norms. The left one is uh, L1, the middle one is L3, and the right one is some other norm that I uh, was convenient to draw in ticks. Uh, so I'm going to show you what is, what is B and M for, for these three norms, basically. Okay, so the red vector uh, is a unit vector that, that achieves the maximum. Okay, so for the L1 unit norm, the maximum is achieved in the all ones direction. So this vector would be like 1 over square root n in every coordinate. Um, that has norm uh, square root n. And uh, the median also has a uh, norm almost, or so the, the, the value of the median is almost square root n also. Um, for the, the L3 norm, the situation is different. The maximum value is 1. It's achieved by a standard, standard basis vector. Um, the median value is much smaller. It's like n to the minus 1 sixth. Okay? So this ratio b over m is like n to the 1 sixth. That's, that's quite large, whereas in the first case, the ratio is like constant. Okay. Um, so we're not the first people to uh, talk about this, this ratio. Um, here's an example. Uh, where the ratio is, uh, is actually important for theory of embeddings. Um, so this is a Dvoretsky's theorem, um, famous theorem from analysis, that says if I have an n-dimensional normed linear space and I want to embed L2 into this normed linear space, then the largest dimension D for which I can embed L2 into my space is like uh, n divided by this ratio squared. Okay, so this gives me a, with some constant depending on epsilon, I get a, a 1 plus epsilon distortion embedding. Um, so mc squared is the important part from that slide. So now I'm going to show you a table. I'm going to give you some norms, or the p norms, and I'm going to show you what is b and m for each of the norms, and I'm going to show you that the streaming space complexity of the norm is mc squared. Okay, so consider this experimental evidence. Um, when p is less than 2, then uh, b and m are both like n to the 1 over p minus 1 half. So I, the ratio is constant. The space complexity is log n. Okay, I'm off by a log n factor. Uh, when p is 2, of course, every point has 2 norm 1 because it's the unit sphere. Uh, space complexity is log n. That's the algorithm I described in the second slide. When p is bigger than 2, b is 1. And m is n to the 1 over p minus 1 half again, but now this is a really small number. Um, the space complexity is uh, exactly this value. So that was determined in 2005 by uh, Woodruff with some extra polylog factors, Indican Woodruff. Okay, so, so the question is uh, is that the right number for, for every symmetric norm? Here's a bunch of symmetric norms, it seems to work. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, here's a counterexample. So the counterexample looks like the maximum of the L infinity norm and the L1 norm, uh, but scaled down by a factor square root n. Okay, so um, you can trust me that there's still some, there's actually some connection to this mc squared, but uh, in order to understand it, we're going to diagnose uh, what's the problem with this norm. Okay, so there's a norm, and and the problem is the uh, L infinity part. So Approximating the L infinity norm on data stream is very difficult. If I had the L infinity norm on dimension n stream, I need linear n number of bits. So that's uh, pretty much as bad as storing the entire vector. Okay, there's not a good algorithm for L infinity norm. But, but this norm hides in a lower dimension, dimension square root n, it hides a copy of L infinity norm. All right, so if, I, if you think about restricting to points which have only square root n non-zero coordinates, then, then among those points, this, uh, this norm is exactly the same as L infinity. This L infinity will always be the, the maximum of the two. So uh, 
if I had an algorithm for approximating this norm, I could have an approximating for alg an, an, an algorithm for approximating the L infinity norm on, on square root number of dimensions. All right, so that would, that would give me a lower bound of uh, uh, n to the 1 half space. Uh, and in fact, mc, the ratio for, for this norm on square root n dimensions, I'm sorry, the, the ratio for this norm must be at least uh, n to the 1 quarter. So we see that uh, by looking at the infinity norm. OK, so this kind of uh, suggests an easy fix. Since uh, streaming algorithm is uh, sort of worst case, and I can have any support size uh, smaller than n in my stream, I should really look at all of the norms on smaller support. So each norm, uh, say, on, on uh, I, I induce a norm on k coordinates from the norm on, on n dimensions just by padding with zeros. So I should look at all of those norms. And if I think that mc squared is the right parameter, then it should be at least the maximum of all those mc squareds. Uh, um, and in fact, that's, that's our main theorem. So we're defining the maximum modulus of concentration. So for each dimension smaller than n, I'll define an induced norm where I just pad the norm with, pad the vector with zeros. Each of those is a, uh, so each, on, for each k, that's a, a norm on RK, and I ha it, has a, it has a B and it has an M. So I can look at all of those N different ratios. I compute the maximum. And, uh, and then our theorem says that uh, for every symmetric norm, there's an algorithm using MMC squared space with some polylog factor. And uh, there's also a matching lower bound uh, without the polylog factor. OK. So, First, I'm going to give you two examples, and then I'll tell you kind of what is the strategy of the algorithm, what's the strategy of the analysis of it. Um, the first example is it's called the top k norm. So for this norm, I take the uh, k coordinates with largest absolute value, and I sum them up. You could think about applying another norm to, uh, besides L1 to the, to the k uh, largest coordinates. So we can determine the streaming space complexity for this norm. It's uh, n over k. So as far as I know, there's no other algorithm which uh, approximates this norm. Um, another one uh, is called the k-support norm. So for this norm, as far as I know, there's no formula to compute the norm. I can't just like plug in the coordinates and get out the value. There's an algorithm that computes it. The most conveni convenient way to describe it is by its unit ball. Okay, so the unit ball is I take the the, the L2 unit ball, uh, and I restrict to all the points which have support size k. So this is a subset of the L2 unit ball, and then I convexify it. So I take a convex hull, and that defines a convex set, which is the unit ball for this, this norm. OK, so um, this norm actually falls in a, in a much bigger class of norms called, called Q prime norms. If you're familiar with the theory of symmetric norms, you might know them. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, for all norms in that class, we'll show that, that the ratio is at most log n, so we have a polylogarithmic approximation algorithm. This, this same class contains uh, the LP norms for, for p less than or equal to 2. Um, OK. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about the algorithm and the analysis. Uh, we're going to start with the strategy of the algorithm. And then I'll tell you how we implement the strategy, uh, which is the indicant Woodruff uh, hierarchical subsampling algorithm. Um, and then at the very end, I'll give you a proof uh, roughly of, of um, why the uh, measure concentration properties of the norm come into play and, and how that implies the space complexity. Okay. So here's the strategy. I've drawn in the upper left the uh, frequency vector. So this is like the vector on the first slide. I just turned it on its side. Uh, or if you like, I did a, a plot command. And I've sorted the coordinates in increasing order. Um, so the, there's some zero coordinates, and then they, they increase from there to the right. Um, so the first step in the algorithm, or sorry, not the first step in the algorithm, the first uh, thing the algorithm is trying to do, so the strategy of the algorithm, is to round the coordinates. Okay, so I'm going to round each coordinate up 
to the next power of, uh, say, 1 plus epsilon. I think I put an alpha there. Um, so something like 1 plus epsilon, you can think about rounding up by to powers of 2, if you like. Uh, since the norm is symmetric, we said it's monotonic. Because it's monotonic, this means that there's a, only a small change in the value of the norm when I do this rounding. So if I round up to power 1 plus epsilon, then I get a most of 1 plus epsilon change in the value of the norm. OK. Um, so this already gives me a, a small summary of the vector, which has approximately the same norm. If I stored the number of coordinates with each value, with each uh, rounded value, um, then I could reconstruct this vector in the upper right. Okay, and I told you that the norm of this vector is approximately the norm of my original vector, so, so it would suffice to just determine the number of coordinates in each of those levels. Okay, we can't do that. That would actually require linear space. It's still too hard a uh, task. So what we're going to do is we're just going to forget about some levels. And on the next slide, I'll give you the rule for, for how we decide which levels to forget about. Um, you can think about uh, there are levels that, that once we forget about them, they're not going to have an impact on the value of the norm. Okay, so, so here in the second level, the second uh, line, we cross out some levels, and then we're left with this vector. In my example, it has four different levels. Okay, so I'll call one level i, denoted by vi, and uh, ni will be the number of, of coordinates in the level i. Okay, so the idea of the algorithm is now to, uh, to estimate the, uh, the cardinalities of each of those levels. Okay, so uh, the rounding is pretty simple. For the second step, was, I said we're going to forget about some levels. So how do we decide which levels to forget about? Let's define... Uh, a level to be beta contributing if uh, the norm of the level by itself. So, so by here, norm of vi, what I mean is I, I take the items in level i and I leave them untouched, and the remaining items, I round them all down to zero. Okay, so this, this uh, vector just has uh, a constant value over the set of items in vi and zero everywhere else. So I'll say this level is beta contributing if the norm of that vector is at least a beta fraction of the norm of uh, the original vector, or the, the total rounded vector. Um, so there's going to be, at most, uh, log n levels. Um, that's because, I did say it earlier, but we're assuming that the uh, length of the stream is polynomial in the dimension. Okay. Um, if, if that's not the case, then we already require linear space just to compute the length of the stream. And we're sort of in a situation where it's not going to help to, to, to use the streaming algorithm. So we're going to assume that, uh, so, so because of this, the number of levels is like logarithmic because we rounded to powers of 1 plus epsilon or 1 plus alpha. Um, and then you can just use the triangle inequality. It's not even really a lemma. It's the triangle inequality that says that I lose at most uh, a beta additive for each level um, that I discard. OK, so if I choose betas like epsilon over log n, then um, what I get here is still like a, a 1 plus epsilon approximation. OK. So now let me show you how we estimate the cardinalities of a level. So this is, uh, this is the main idea of the Indic and Woodruff 2005 algorithm. So I've drawn at the top the four levels in my example. And um, the strategy is to randomly subsample items from the stream. So I'm going to subsample coordinates of the vector with log n different probabilities. And then I'm going to try to determine what's the last uh, row in which an item appears from a level. Okay, so if, I, so if I look at this first level on the left, there's an item that appears in, in uh, the row where I sampled with probability 1 over n. So I'm going to estimate there's about n items in that level. Okay, uh, in, the, in the, the third one from the left, you see I uh, run out of, of items from that level at the third level. That's just sampling probability 1 over 4. I'll estimate there's four items. That's not exactly uh, the way the algorithm works. You need some more control on the error, but uh, that's kind of the idea of it. Okay, so um, what's going to happen is once we've done the sampling, 
we're going to have log n different streams. Okay, one for each of these uh, sampling probabilities. And um, we're going to be looking to identify a, an, a single item from, from one of these levels. So that seems like a hard task. Um, but uh, it's actually uh, it's going it's to work out that we can, we can do this by identifying an item in this level with the largest frequency. Uh, we'll be able to use a count sketch for this. This is the idea. That's the, uh, how the Indicate Woodruff 2005 algorithms work. OK. So now um, let me tell you a little bit about why we can identify these items. OK. Um, this is not Indic Woodruff 2005. Sorry, there's two typos on this slide. There's also uh, this alpha should be a 1 plus alpha, so both of those. Um, this is uh, not Indic Woodruff. OK, so, so we have a, is a sort of key lemma. And this lemma is where the uh, measure concentration properties of the norm come in. Okay, what it allows us to do is allows us to control the contribution of the levels uh, to the overall norm. Okay, so, so this one with an n prime, that's a vector with n prime ones and uh, n minus n prime zeros. Okay, so it basically looks like a, le like a level by itself, one of these vectors vi that I was describing earlier. So what I'm saying is I can control the norm of this vector this is, this is essentially the, the contribution of a level um, by n prime over, over n, for example. N, n, could be as, n double prime could be as large as n. So as the level gets smaller, its contribution to the norm gets smaller, modulo a factor of a, a MMC. OK. So this has uh, this, this lemma, which I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little idea about the proof later on, has uh, two important consequences for us. Okay. They're expressed by these inequalities. And then, like I said, this should be a 1 plus alpha to the 2i and to the 2j. OK. So the first consequence says if I look at just this vector, so take everything in level i and uh, to the left, so the smaller frequencies, um, I have ni times 1 plus alpha to the 2i. That's ni times 1 plus alpha to the i squared. That's the contribution to, to L2 squared from this level. So, so this level contributes a significant fraction of the L2 for the vector that starts, starts here and goes left. OK, so it's like uh, when I find beta contributing, I say this, vec this uh, level is uh, beta over MMC contributing for L2 on those uh, frequencies. And, and among the larger frequencies, there's, there's not too many of them. OK, so it'll, um, by, by an MMC factor, modulo an MMC factor, the ith level is larger than the sum of all of the levels above it. The, the cardinality of the ith level is larger than the cardinality of all the levels above it. OK. Um, yeah. So this control is the, is the important property which we derive. It's a structural property of the norm. We derive it from measure concentration. OK. So let me go back a slide. So, um, so, so how does this allow us to, to, to find these items highlighted in blue? Um, I said before we're going to use a count sketch. And, uh, and, and these two inequalities tell us that the count sketch will work to find the item. So what does a count sketch do? A count sketch takes the items in the stream and hashes it into many different buckets. Okay? And then it looks for an item which lands in a bucket that contributes a significant fraction of the uh, L2 size of the bucket. Okay? So now if I hash into like MMC squared over beta squared different buckets, let's say 100 times MMC squared over beta squared different buckets, then an item from the ith level is not going to collide with any items from the higher levels. Okay? That's, given, that's because of this inequality on the right. Uh, second is, uh, if I also, okay, so sec the second is that, that, that an item from the uh, ith level is going to be uh, an L2 heavy hitter in that, in that bucket. Okay? It's going to contribute a significant fraction of the L2 value of that bucket. So the first one says it's going to be the largest frequency. The second one says it's an L2 heavy hitter. That's exactly what the count sketch was designed to do. It finds an L2 heavy hitter when it's the largest frequency. Okay. 
So the algorithm is uh, perform this sampling. So the sampling is done ahead of time. We decide who's going to go into uh, which sets. Then that creates uh, log n different streams, each with a different number of items in the stream. Um, on each of those streams, I run a big count sketch. The size of the count sketch is determined by this parameter mmc squared uh, with some polylog factor. And, uh, and then at the end, I can identify from the count sketch all of these uh, items that I've circled here, and we can, we can get an estimate for the level sizes. So once we have an estimate for the level sizes, we actually have an estimate for the entire uh, vector of frequencies itself. Okay. Once we have an estimate for the vector, we can plug that into an algorithm that computes the norm. Okay, so I, I require that you provide me an algorithm which is going to compute the norm on this vector, which I described by, by the levels. Um, I can't guarantee I can also compute the value of the norm in small space. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about the, this key lemma. It's control on the, the levels as the size of the levels decreases. And uh, here's where the measure concentration comes in. So we're going to use Levy's lemma. Um, let me tell you what's the goal, and then I'll tell you how the proof of the key lemma goes. It's one line of inequalities once I uh, describe the Levy's lemma part. And then I'll go back in and describe in more detail about Levy's lemma and what it, what it says. OK, so, so our goal is this, to prove that this, uh, this vector on the left side has a value that's, that's a, the norm of here is, is approximately uh, the median. So I want to prove that this vector in the all ones direction looks like a random vector to the norm. OK, that's the idea. When we do that, we get uh, this in, approximate in, uh, equality right here. OK, so I have the, the median for n double prime, and I have the vector in the all ones direction on n double prime coordinates. OK, the rest of it is really simple. This is, uh, this is just because, because b maximizes the norm, and n double prime is bigger than n prime. So, so b is sort of like a feasible for the, for the um, n double, for this vector is like feasible for the definition of b. Um, the second one is just the definition of MMC. Uh, and then the third one is this thing I'm going to tell you about how to prove now from Levy's lemma. OK. So Levy's lemma is about uh, concentration of continuous functions on the unit sphere. So here's what it says. If I take a continuous function on the unit sphere, uh, it has a median. So that I've drawn the median in the slide with a red line. It kind of wraps around the sphere. It's got two, dis two little disjoint parts. Um, and, and specifically, it, it, it bounds the, the area that's close to the median. Okay, So I'm looking at a, an epsilon with band around the median on the sphere. Okay, this epsilon is the U L2 distance between or f from a point that, that satisfies the, 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 that has the median as its, as its value. Okay, so what Levy's lemma says is that if I look at all those points, which are only epsilon distance from the median, then they make up almost the entire surface of the sphere. Okay, so, so in particular, um, if I choose to say epsilon is like 3 over uh, square root n, then what this says is like 90% of the points on the unit sphere are within L2 distance uh, 3 over square root n from the median. It's a very it's for some, some point that, that has the median as its value. Okay? So, so all of these points are very close to some point having the, uh, the median. Now, where it comes into play for norms is norm is continuous function. It's Lipschitz continuous, in fact. And the Lipschitz constant is b. OK? So uh, if we look at how much can the norm change uh, over this epsilon width region, the norm can only change by an amount that's b times epsilon. OK, so when I said epsilon is like 1 over square root n to get 90%, we can get like b over square root n change. So only a tiny. Tiny change in the norm over uh, this, this region. Um, so, so what we use that for is we're, we're going to use a probabilistic method. 
And uh, we can simultaneously find a point that has strong control on the norm, strong control on the L infinity norm, and strong control on the L1 norm. Okay? Uh, from, from those last two, uh, we can prove that the point, uh, there's another point which has uh, uh, the same norm in all three and is uh, kind of very close to the all ones vector, the vector in the all ones direction. Okay, so since it's very close to that vector, we have, a, we have established that the all ones vector is very close to the, to the median of the original uh, uh, norm. Okay, it's close to the median of all, of all three norms, actually. Okay. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the idea. It's a probabilistic method proof to prove the existence of some point. Um, so, so overall, here's the uh, way the algorithm works. We do subsampling. That's like log n factor on the space or log squared n, maybe, depending on how we choose the parameters. And... Um, we compute a count sketch. Each of the count sketches requires MMC squared bits, or more than MMC squared bits. Um, so the total space is like MMC squared times some polylog factor. Okay, I, I won't tell you about the lower bound. It's a reduction from the multi-party disjointness problem. Um, but uh, so that's the end of the talk. That's the streaming complexity for any symmetric norm. Thanks for your attention. The assumption would be the uh, implicit in the setup would be the assumption that the entries of f are non-negative integers. That, do I understand it correctly? Um, no. Oh. So the way I described it, everything was non-negative, but uh, but it, it will work if they're not because um, this algorithm, the count sketch is a. a all right, so that's this one. Um, so when we run the, we're running a count sketch on every one of these rows. So count sketch is just a linear function of the frequency vector. So it will find an item which is uh, uh, contributing to, to L2, whether the item has a positive frequency or a negative frequency. OK, so, so the algorithm uh, works also for, um, for arbitrary. It's, it's, this, is, this is a linear sketch. So, so what we've done is, we, <clears throat> I mean, if we put all this together, you can form, formulate it as a big random matrix. And we're computing the, in, the product of this matrix uh, with the frequency vector. But in the original, like there's like the first slide, I think, where you yeah. had the numbers that just since it's tell you the coordinate, like you're seeing a particular coordinate, you're supposed to increment the count in that coordinate. Yeah. So how would you encode like non-integer frequencies or negative frequencies? Like how does it even make uh, sense in that formulation? So so there you could think about uh, rather than just having a list of the items, you could have a, a list of the items which each carry a, a, a change to the to the coordinate. So like additions and deletions are fine. Uh, you run into some problems if. Uh, like range problems if you have values that are very small or very large, because then this also requires a lot of space to store. But uh, it still works. Other questions?